I'm Danny Campos here at the Historic Palace Theater, home of the Growing Stage, the Children's Theater of New Jersey. And I'm here with Steve Fredericks, the executive director and founder. So TYUSA on their blog right now, the current mm -hmm. topic is non-traditional TYA. Correct. And I thought uh, that this would be a good topic for us to talk about because I feel over the, the theater's 33-year history, that's something that you're always looking to tackle and finding ways to really enhance the theater going experience, bring in some new titles, you know, grow the genre of TYA. Sure. So I think my first question to you is what is non-traditional TYA to you? Well, I think that that's, that's a really, it should be looked at as a very open question. Um, because I know while many of us are very concerned about that we do too many adaptations or we do too many fairy tales, I also think you can flip that around and look at it as an opportunity to approach a story in a different light than what the audience is anticipating. Right. And I think that's always the challenge for us as well within this genre of theater, is that um, who we're really challenging are the adults that bring the kids to the theater. <laughs> the kids come in with, a, with an open slate. Uh, nothing's written on that chalkboard necessarily. It's the parents that come in with the preconceived notions. So I think that uh, it's not only looking at um, wonderful new pieces that are being written without being inspired by an adapt, you know, a, an original book, um, but you can also look at those adaptations and those fairy tales right. and see how can it talk to the audience of today as well as it did to the audience of yesterday. Um, and I think they're, they're, those threads are in there. And it's just a matter of challenging ourselves um, while we challenge our audiences um, with that fresh perspective. Right. Well, ironically, we're actually sitting on the set of A Year with Frog and Toad. Mm -hmm. So talking about book adaptations, sure. I think, you know, how do you go about creating an evocative or, you know, a, a thought-provoking piece using a book adaptation? And let's use... Frog and Toad, let's say, as an example. Well, um, that's a bit of a challenge. I mean, uh, evocative is one piece. Right. Challenging is another. Um, and and every piece that you put on the stage for young people, if it, if it has the respect that you desire as an artist, it's intrinsically challenging um, and, so that, and has value. And so that while Frog and Toad, you know, has no underlying theme to it, um, beyond the, the strength of a friendship. You can still look at that and approach it in discussion afterwards with how do you combat bullying? Because somebody could consider um, in, in a very sensitive time that we live in right now that during sometimes during the piece Frog is bullying Toad by encouraging him to do things that he's not ready to do right. or to tackle like going down the sled by himself and, and things of that nature. Um, so that you can, you can talk about that sensitivity that no, well, Frog's not really bullying Toad in doing this action or taking this action on. He's trying to encourage him. Now, are there better ways to encourage right. him than pushing him down a hill um, where he's terrified? Of course. Um, and so within this piece, you, can, you look at that. But to use your example of a piece that we've done in the past, uh, we did the, a production called The Emperor's New Clothes. Title was very safe to the right. parents bringing the young people here. But the way we looked at, at it as artists is we brought it to the modern world where an emperor that was um, obsessed with wearing the latest fashions. So everything in the kingdom was, you know, grunge okay. or he had right. billboards, and, you know, Calvin Klein, you know, nothing comes between me and my Calvin Kleins and, and brought that issue to front right. utilizing a well-known fairy tale um, in the process. Great. So let's talk about, I guess, an unsafe title or an unknown title. So we just did the world premiere, the professional world premiere of And Then Came Tango. Right. So talk about how that fits into this, this mold of non-traditional TYA and, sure. and being unconventional. Well, it, uh, we, we approach it in a very conventional way. Uh, we looked at it uh, as a piece um, that had a subject matter um, that might uh, challenge, again, our adults coming through right. the door um, and to encourage them to be able to, um, to talk about a subject that our young people are dealing with in schools on a daily basis um, and, to, um, and to look at it in a different light. 
Um, so what we did was uh, with the penguins, um, they, that's, their story was told through modern dance, uh, something that's universal, um, uh, universal and ageless, uh, you know, uh, as a, an art medium. As far as the story, the bond between um, uh, Lily and her mother, uh, Lily and Walter, who was the zookeeper, the focus of it was the love that they felt. Um, and that there's a bond, a natural bond, that takes place between an, an older person and a young person. Right. And that, that uh, transcends sex. It transcends anything else. Um, that one generation um, inherently wants to look after the next, whether it's their child or not. They see a responsibility and, and embrace um, an opportunity to, to somehow guide the life of the next generation. That's what the focus of the mm -hmm. piece was. It wasn't that there were two gay penguins. Right. To, to embrace that or to look at that or to highlight that only highlights what some and many consider uh, a weakness in our society at this point, the inability to see beyond themselves. Right. Um, and so that that's how we chose, um, with the playwright's blessing, Emily Freeman, to, uh, to take it within that direction. And I think it was very successful. Right. I don't mean to cut you sure. off. Um, I'll just talk, talk, talk. No, no. <laughs> but what I loved about, you know, going back to the penguins and the whole modern dance, yeah. you know, we're so used to this idea in TYA that, you know, they should talk, right, right. you know? Um, well, and, 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 and you look at dance, and one of the, the gifts of dance and telling a story through dance right. is that it's, it celebrates life. And it's been done for, for you know, ages. You know, back to the, the beautiful artwork that you see in cave dwellings, it's dance that they're doing. It's a dance of hunting and herding and, and, and gathering and, and right. all of that, so that it was natural to be able to tell this story in, in part through dance, um, because it only, um, it only complements what's said in Emily's spoken word. Right. One of the programs that we have here at the Growing Stages Studio Series, mm -hmm. I think is also a great example of this idea of non-traditional t because we're taking, you know, these popular titles. So we've done, you know, the Odyssey, Canterbury Tales. We're working with an all-youth cast, but right. I think also the, the, the staging of it is, is non-conventional. You right. know, I'm thinking, you know, for Odyssey, it was all ladders and blocks and garbage cans, a shopping cart to bring the world of the Odyssey, um, you know, with Canterbury Tales, the same style. You know, it really focuses on uh, storytelling and also gives the audience an opportunity to really use their imagination um, to, to play into that. I think that's, that's one of the goals, especially when you're working with an all youth cast, right. because you're not only performing for the audience that they're, that's coming through, right. but you're, again, you're, you're, you're teaching the next generation of artists that are going to take our stage and other stages around the country. Uh, and so that you want to, you want to give them that freedom. And that's the gift of our medium that, you know, when we talk about conventional and non-conventional, it should be solely in the mindset of the people in the audience's mind. It should not be any part of our mind as artists because everything should be unconventional. Right. <laughs> everything should be looked at as, as uh, how can I stretch this? Not only myself, but my, you know, my genre of theater. How can I break that preconceived notion um, in a way that complements the story being told? Not doing something for the sake of doing something, but doing something because it propels the idea uh, forward right. um, and, and the playwright's passion forward um, and the art form forward. I think that's where we always should be looking to do as to what can we do now better than we did before. Absolutely. And I think for us as a company, one thing that we're doing to move the art form forward is through our new play reading festival. Right. So talk about that a little bit. That's, um, that's the fastest growing um, portion of our company and something that, um, that under the tutelage of, uh, of the, our director of that program, Steve Graham, has just blossomed. Um, it was something that we started with six plays four years ago to this year having um, 161 submissions from literally around the world. Um, and it, it's... Uh, they're all fresh ideas. Even if some are adaptations, 
or some are based on fairy tales. It's, it's a new energy coming into our field that as artists, it's our responsibility to continually cultivate and, and provide opportunity for. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me Anytime, to talk about non-traditional <laughs> TYA. So that's what we're doing here at the Growing Stage, the Children's Theater of New Jersey. And I guess I'm going to throw it back out there to uh, the, the web yes. folks and, and to the other TYA companies and just ask them, you know, what are you doing that's non-traditional and non-conventional? So. Keep pushing it. Keep pushing it. Thank you. <laughs>